Good evening to you all and uh, good morning to Professor Nilay Shah from London. It is great to be with you today online in this um, distinguished lecture and also a conference plenary session. I am so delighted today that I am joined uh, by Professor Nilay Shah from uh, Imperial College London who will deliver this Faculty of Engineering Distinguished Lecture and Conference Plenary Session to us on the topic of hydrogen systems, opportunities and challenges. As part of the first Net Zero Initiative Conference and the third Australian Circular Economy Conference. First, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I am currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here at the University of Sydney and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Allow me to introduce Professor Shah to you. Nilay Shah is a Professor of Process Systems Engineering at Imperial College. He is interested in the use of models and process systems engineering techniques to understand and design low carbon energy and industrial systems. He is a member of the UK government's Hydrogen Advisory Council and CTO of a synthetic fuels business. In this lecture, Nile will discuss the role of hydrogen in the uh, future low carbon energy systems and explore the value it can bring to the energy and industrial systems of the future. The context will be a UK one, but most of the insights will translate to other geographies, and we expect also to see those synergies or those analogies to Australia. Nile will also discuss some opportunities for hydrogen research and um, hydrogen uh, development. With this introduction, allow me to hand over to you, Nile, to proceed with your lecture. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. <coughs> Pleasure to be with all of you. So today I'm going to talk a bit about hydrogen from a, from a systems opportunities and, and challenges perspective. Just to set some context, so hydrogen is, is extremely topical at the moment, although interestingly enough, a lot of companies in the hydrogen space, they've probably seen their share price drop a little bit because I think people got a bit overexcited in the last few years. So we've had these three waves of hydrogen, the 70s motivated by the oil shock, in the 90s when people started to become serious about climate change and we're looking at opportunities for decarbonization. And also there were a lot of breakthroughs in electrolysis and particularly fuel cells. And then the most recent wave I think is, is the most serious. And I think one where finally the potential you know, will be realized where so many different countries are thinking about low carbon systems and how to piece them together. What does net zero mean? And what they're learning is that hydrogen is, is an effective point source solution for many problems. And in a way, what's held it back in the previous two ways is that we haven't taken a systems approach. We've been looking at a point by point approach. And often we find that it's not necessarily the single best solution for a single purpose. So heat pumps can provide heating, battery vehicles can provide personal transport, biofuels can provide long range transport. Uh, when people start to take a, a whole energy system perspective, which is, of course, needed for net zero, we can think of hydrogen as, as an important middleware, almost like the equivalent of an electrical grid. And then we'll see the benefits because we employ it at scale and we enable <clears throat> hydrogen to be used in locations where it's separate from where it's produced. So I think the real challenge now that people are struggling with is not how do they see the role of hydrogen in, let's say, the decades of 2050 or 2060, they, they see how you would use hydrogen in a net zero economy, is how do we go from here to there? And that's what I've been looking at because that, that's one of my personal interests. So we've been doing a lot of thinking on, you know, what will hydrogen do in this future low carbon energy and industrial system? So one very important feature, particularly for chemical engineers, is hydrogen as a, as a feedstock. So increasingly using hydrogen as part of a process to make something else, which could be, for example, um, 
iron and steel. So replacing uh, thermal coke, uh, not thermal coke, sorry, metallurgic coke, uh, synthetic fuels, um, other types of uh, synthetic materials, for example, plastics that are made from carbon dioxide and so on. Uh, provision of heat by replacing natural gas, so industrial, commercial and residential heat, power generation and combined heat and power, long distance transport, where it might be in the form of hydrogen, but it might indeed be hydrogen with a carrier. So that could be ammonia, for example, or synthetic fuels again. Energy storage, in particular, long duration energy storage. So in Europe, we, as you are probably familiar, need to store chemical energy through the summer to use in the winter. At the moment, we're relying on natural gas, which has caused a lot of stress. So there's a lot of thinking about hydrogen can be used as a long duration energy store. And then perhaps most interesting, especially for a country like Australia, is a way of moving low carbon energy. Because at the moment, the only way of moving low carbon energy is, is, is through nuclear or renewable electricity, and grids tend to be quite national or regional. So hydrogen is a long distance energy carrier. So if we take a systems view, we can look at hydrogen in four different uh, perspectives, which are uh, where does the energy come from? As we know, hydrogen doesn't exist in, a, uh, in its reduced form in nature. So we have to find it from somewhere. We can make it by converting carbonaceous materials like fossil fuels and biomass. We can electrolyze water. We can also uh, reform natural gas. Uh, then there's the storing and moving. So how do we store it and how do we move it? What are the options there? And then, of course, ultimately what I discussed earlier was, you know, how we might use it. And by connecting these things together, not only do you see how you go from left to right, but you identify some, some synergistic opportunities between these end uses. And that's something I'll, I'll say a bit more about later on. Take a step back uh, to low carbon energy and industrial systems. One of the key things that people often debate is, should the future be all electric or, you know, should, should we be using lots of hydrogen or what's the role of biofuels? And actually, my hypothesis is that future low carbon systems will need multiple low carbon energy vectors. So an energy vector is a way of moving, storing and using low carbon energy. And every single region will use some proportion of these four vectors, electricity, hydrogen, biofuels, and synthetic fuels, what we will see is national variations and regional variations. The other thing that we're seeing that the energy system is going to have to do is going to have to be net negative in its CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent emissions. And the reason it's going to have to be net negative is that the rest of the economy is very difficult to have as a gross negative uh, emission system, particularly in agricultural economies. So there we see, for example, bio, bio, biomass reforming plus carbon capture and storage producing hydrogen as an energy vector, but actually on a life cycle basis, actually having negative emissions as an example. So in the UK, and I have no idea if this is the case in Australia, but in the UK, the debate about how much hydrogen we might have has become very theological almost in nature. And a lot of people saying, oh no, you should just use electricity because hydrogen is, is inefficient to make through electrolysis. In, in reality, they're not comparing the same thing because a chemical store of energy, which can then be used for multiple purposes is different from electrons that are moving in a wire. So when you're comparing energy vectors, you have to think about what services they provide to the energy system and therefore, unless those services are identical, you can't actually compare them. You have to look at a systems perspective and then see what emerges from that system. So this was a very nice study, which is a very good example of a, of a whole systems approach. So this was a study that we participated in, um, which was looking at uh, a UK energy and industrial system, which was a net zero system. And we looked at two scenarios. One was what we call balance scenario, where we essentially had an unbiased view of the energy system. We just said, what is a low cost or the lowest cost net zero system? And how does that emerge in terms of the key energy vectors? And what we found there 
is for the UK, we were using 236 terawatt hours per year uh, of hydrogen. And that's typically a kind of consensus figure of how much hydrogen we might use in a low carbon energy system. So people are talking about between 200 and 350. And for context, the current amount of natural gas we use is, is about a thousand. So it is less than, than in the than natural gas. And it's being used for some residential heating, a lot of feedstock purposes and some long distance transport, and then some energy storage and power generation. So because of this debate, the other scenario we ran was what we call the electrified scenario. We said, essentially, let's squeeze hydrogen out of the system. Let's try to minimize the use of hydrogen and just see, can you run a low carbon energy system without hydrogen? The answer was no. And in fact, if you, if you want to squeeze hydrogen out of the system, you, you can do that, but actually you still end up with 167 terawatt hours per year. And because you are insisting on the end use uh, as far as possible being electric, what we find is a lot more of the hydrogen is being used to store energy and then reuse that for power generation. So essentially you cannot remove hydrogen from a low carbon energy system at least in the context of the UK. So I think that was a very interesting finding and it, it put to bed a little bit this issue of, do you really need hydrogen? Furthermore, the balance scenario was costing around 109 billion pounds a year. And the scenario with less hydrogen was costing 122 billion pounds per year. So that additional uh, 70 or so terawatt hours per year of hydrogen is saving us 13 billion pounds a year. So you can start to calculate the system value of the hydrogen. So a lot of people talk about levelized cost of hydrogen uh, and that's kind of useful, but it falls apart at the system level. When you're at the system level, it's much better to calculate the system value. So that 70 terawatt hours is saving 13 billion. So you can divide 13 billion by 70 and you can actually get a system value of the hydrogen, what value does it bring? So a lot of our systems models are used to calculate this concept called system value. This is the Committee for Climate Change. It's a, an independent agency set up by the government. And they're talking about how much hydrogen again, again, they use integrated models and they come up with a, a very close figure to ours, which is this uh, 200, approximately 220 terawatt hours per year. And on the left hand side, you can see the supply. What's interesting by 2050, it's about half electroly electrolysis hydrogen, half is some kind of reforming plus CCS, but the purple is actually imported. And then these are the end uses of the hydrogen. So we can see that it is uh, being, it's uh, a, lot, a lot being used in shipping, a lot being used in power generation, and a lot being used as industrial feedstock. Good, that's 2050. But how do we get there from here? So our, our view is, why would you do the difficult things first? You know, find the easy things to do and start there and then grow out a hydrogen system from there. One challenge you have with hydrogen is not plug and play. So electricity is a plug and play system. If I buy a solar panel, I can generate electricity and I find the grid to move those electrons and there's an end user somewhere who's using it. I don't even necessarily know who the end user is. So it's completely plug and play. If I buy an electrolyzer, it's completely useless until I have somebody who transport my hydrogen, somebody else who probably store the hydrogen, and most importantly, somebody to use the hydrogen. So to get deployment, you have to actually support the whole value chain simultaneously, which is one of the main pieces of advice we've been giving the UK government. And we think where we would get hydrogen at scale very quickly is what we call low carbon industrial clusters. So these are heavy industry locations, which are already being put under pressure to decarbonize. And as we'll see in a few slides time, one of the obvious options is, is to switch fuels from natural gas or light hydrocarbons to hydrogen. That creates hydrogen at scale and it um, reduces cost because of the scale. And that means other users will quickly be able to link in and you create a hydrogen hub that's regional and then eventually these regional systems can become interconnected and you end up with an, a national hydrogen system. So that, that's our hypothesis of, of, of how you go from A to B. So 
one of the key challenges then is to deploy hydrogen with carbon capture and storage. And what we can see is that a lot of work has happened with hydrogen uh, and CCS. In fact, some of the early projects of carbon capture and storage were actually based on, on natural gas reforming. And that, in a sense, that's obvious because when you are producing hydrogen from natural gas, you already have a stream of relatively pure CO2 that's typically vented. And so you can, uh, you can immediately do something with that and quickly decarbonize the process. And so we can see that you know, the cost of hydrogen without CCS is about 6.5 to 10 uh, US dollars per gigajoule. It depends very much on, on your natural gas costs. This is American natural gas costs. And you can see that uh, eventually you can, you can have a range that's slightly more, and it depends whether you're using enhanced oil recovery or not. So let's look at this issue of industrial clusters and industrial decarbonization. That's where we see the first use. So first of all, one of the reasons why industrial decarbonization is interesting is that when you are trying to decarbonize an economy, again, why not do the easy things first? And if we look at the y-axis, we can see the cost of, of avoided carbon emissions in industrial processing can be relatively low. So we can see natural gas processing, hydrogen production, ammonia production, ethanol production, ethylene oxide. It's less than $40 per tonne, potentially, in terms of, of CO2 capture and avoidance. And so it's, it's, it's a very good place to start. So I'm, I'll, I'll talk a bit about refining in petrochemicals as, as one of the first use cases. So obviously, as a chemical engineer, that's a topic that's very interesting to me. Refining in petrochemicals is, is responsible for about 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Eventually, producing these feedstocks are going to be have to be done in a, in, in a net zero approach, at least in terms of scope two uh, and scope one. And there are relatively few ways of, of decarbonizing. So we, we actually looked at a large petrochemical cluster. It produces fuels. Um, ethylene, ethylene derivatives, polymers and the likes. So it's a, a large complex, one of the largest in Europe. And if we look at the refining, one of the problems of decarbonization is you have different CO2 sources. So these are different sources of CO2. These are the total emissions and the different colors are different concentrations. So this pink color is quite dilute. The uh, turquoise color is, is more concentrated. The orange is very concentrated. So we've got different sources of CO2 with different concentrations and different uh, flow rates as well. So how do we actually mitigate these emissions? One of the other challenges is these different emissions might include other contaminants like NOx and SOx, uh, particularly from the CDU, VDU boilers and FCCU. They have a lot of sulfur dioxide and you know, the normal solvents that we use to capture CO2 will be affected by these contaminants. So this is our, this is our site. Uh, it's quite complicated. You can see it's quite congested as well. And in red, we're showing the major point emissions. So how do we, how do we decarbonize an industrial site that looks like this? And what's the role of hydrogen? So the first thing is the two main strategies, although there is a third one, which is electrification, which we're also working on. The two main strategies are capturing CO2 from these different point sources here by piping the CO2 to some carbon capture plants. We will need to do some additional desulfurization to get rid of those additional contaminants. We'll need some additional combined heat and power because we need additional power for fans and pumps and we need more heat. We also need more cooling uh, to, to condense water and other activities that go up and provide cooling. We have a challenge of access of stacks because you know getting pipe work in a plant that wasn't designed for this additional pipe work can be a problem and some of the sources have low concentration of co2 so we're feeding a lot of other gases into our carbon capture plant and only capturing that small amount of co2 one of the other one of the alternatives given that almost all the emissions in this process are uh, combustion emissions so they're mainly furnaces and boilers. 
and that is combustion of refinery fuel gas and imported natural gas, is switch that fuel to hydrogen. So if we take some of those light gases and natural gas, instead of combusting them, we convert them to hydrogen, capture the CO2, store the CO2 in geological storage, then we have low carbon hydrogen. We'll need some plant to do that. We have to find a location. But what's nice about this plant is it's separate from the complex. So it's piping and so on is not as complicated. The only piping we need to do is to make a hydrogen network to supply those combustion units. Speaking of combustion, you actually have to change uh, some aspects of the furnace and the boiler because hydrogen burns in a different way than light hydrocarbons, in particular the flame speed. So you have to change the combustors and that does cost uh, money and requires retrofits. But the nice thing, you've got a single point source emission stack, just the point at which you are producing the hydrogen. And that's only useful for fuel combustion related emissions, but actually fortunately in this location, it was actually the, the, the case. And so when we look at this uh, situation, we end up actually with a, an integrated solution where some point sources are actually captured using CO2 uh, capture because they're easy to access and it makes sense and it's economic. And then we produce hydrogen down here and it's probably difficult to see, but we pipe it in this blue pipe work. And then the orange is a CO2 network. So this is the hydrogen production. And then we take this CO2, and this is the location of the facility, it goes through a CO2 pipeline and offshore into this geological storage. So actually the best solution is actually a hybrid one. Now to, again, we're very interested in what is the value of hydrogen in this industrial system? So we look at this from the point of view of how, deep can we, how deeply can we decarbonize and what's the cost? So this black line, is if we only have post-combustion capture, so we only have carbon capture, no hydrogen. So the x-axis is how deeply can we decarbonize and what's the cost? So the black line shows that we cannot fully decarbonize only with carbon capture. The dotted line is when we have a hybrid solution, a mix of hydrogen and carbon capture, and we see two things. First of all, we can decarbonize further. And secondly, the cost of CO2 avoided is lower with the hybrid system. That's about $30 per tonne, that difference. So the value hydrogen is bringing is you can go to a deeper decarbonization and you can do it more cheaply. This is showing the actual emissions. So this is now, how do you get there in terms of incentives? So if you think of a carbon price and how much investment does it unlock and what is the carbon intensity of the cluster in green, well, as we increase carbon price, first of all, nothing happens until we reach a critical point. Then we start investing in emissions reduction. And as we increase, we invest more and more in emissions reduction. This last investment is quite interesting. It's investing in a biomass gasification with CCS to produce more hydrogen, but actually with negative emissions. And what we can see with the green is as we invest, the carbon intensity of the industrial cluster is falling and at this point it reaches net zero and eventually we can go net negative. So it shows you that if we use hydrogen in an intelligent way, we can decarbonize an industrial cluster and indeed make it net negative. And I said before net negative is going to be important. So what we can see is that this um, process that is producing hydrogen uh, using reforming of light gases is a, is a cost effective approach. We'll see that electrolysis over time, I think, will quite quickly become cost effective with this, particularly in advantaged locations. And indeed, central uh, West Australia is the, has the most sunshine in the world, I think. So that's going to be an advantaged location for, for solar generated hydrogen. If we cluster industries, we get economies of scale. So this is Rotterdam with a, a, a CO2 cluster, they all share the same pipeline. So you get a lot of savings when you, when you have these clusters. Um, at the moment, the current CO2 price doesn't really drive anywhere near net zero. We need a, a big increase. Um, how, uh, another mechanism 
This is for hydrogen, not for the, so for CO2, we can have a, an emissions trading scheme. The UK is creating um, some other concepts. So first of all, for economic sustainability of the domestic industry, if we're decarbonizing, say, ammonia and iron and steel, as examples, how do we avoid imports of high carbon products? Well, the idea is to use a carbon border adjustment mechanism. So it's a mechanism that looks at the carbon intensity of imported products and applies a carbon price. Uh, in other countries like Australia and the Netherlands, there will also be an, a, a curiosity about how do you support low carbon exports? So if Australia is exporting low carbon hydrogen, for example, how does that compete with non-low carbon hydrogen and is it sufficient that there's just a market for low carbon hydrogen or will it need government support for that? So these are things people are, are thinking about in terms of policy. For carbon capture and storage, a lot of the support may well be in the form of infrastructure support. So capital support for, for pipelines and for the storage locations and providing insurance for the storage location. And then for low carbon hydrogen in the UK, we're developing a, a so-called business model which is essentially saying that imagine you are selling hydrogen and the price you're getting is, is varying. What would happen as a producer of hydrogen is you have a strike price and you have a contract for difference with the government. And if the selling price for you is less than, or the reference price, let's say, is less than the strike price, you get a subsidy. But if you're selling for more than the strike price, you actually get uh, have to pay back the government some money. So essentially, you get a price guarantee. And essentially, this strike price is set as a constant, and this reference price is set to be the greater of what you achieved and the price of natural gas. So it, it stops you selling hydrogen for less than the price of natural gas and colluding with a customer just so that you can get a big subsidy for the government. So if you sell for less than the price of natural gas, you won't get an additional subsidy. That's the current model in the UK. So the UK is going to have two industrial clusters initially, one in the Northwest and one in the Northeast. And so we see hydrogen being deployed at scale in those locations and being used also for transport systems and, and low carbon heating. And then what we see is a growth over time of a, of, a, of a backbone and eventually a, a hydrogen grid. And that hydrogen grid not only has pipelines and production, it also has storage. So this is showing you, again, the system value of storage. So as we increase the storage to about 100 tero hours, which is about six months worth of, of storage, we can see a cost reduction from about 32 billion for this hydrogen system to about 26 billion. So you can actually see storage provides a lot of value. It reduces the cost of the system because essentially we have a very seasonal system in the UK. And if you store hydrogen over the summer, then you can use it in the winter without having additional production assets, which are more expensive than storage. And we can see quite strong correlation of the hydrogen cost with the gas price with the biomass price, to some extent with the electricity price and with the cost of these storage caverns. So to get there, we need these local industrial cluster networks. This is the first activity that's beginning to be planned in the UK, blending hydrogen into the gas distribution network, which will create metering issues, then understand how far we can put hydrogen in our national gas transmission system and whether we need to put liners or other retrofits or what are the materials challenges there. And then explore what's called de-blending, taking hydrogen out of a mixed gas in the gas grid so you can purify it at a local place for low temperature fuel cells, which need high purity hydrogen. We need to roll out end use technologies. So we need some custom boilers and furnaces for industrial use combined into power. There are now turbines and engines being developed for hydrogen and then hydrogen boilers for residential and commercial. I think a lot of understanding around safety. So for, for your engineering faculty, you know, thinking about safety and actually often people overstate the safety challenges of hydrogen. Um, 
in many ways it's no more dangerous than, than other light gases and it's more a question of having appropriate understanding and appropriate management systems. And then I think again very important is not to try to let things just evolve chaotically but to do some degree of master planning because as I said hydrogen is not a plug and play technology. It needs support for the whole value chain. So that means it's worth trying to do some regional and national master planning of, of what the hydrogen might look like, and especially trying to find effective storage locations for hydrogen. So we've, we've looked at the cluster level, we've looked at the national level, we're also working on um, a, a global trade model. So we're looking at each region from the demand point of view, what is its demand curve by running energy systems models in different regions and essentially looking at how varying the hydrogen price affects the hydrogen deployment in the low carbon energy system that creates a demand curve. And then we have a lot of um, key locations which are going to be probably hydrogen producing locations. And there what we do is we develop a supply curve where we look at what are the options to produce hydrogen from natural gas from electrolysis and so on. And what does the supply curve look like? And then by solving a global equilibrium model, we can see what the thing might look like in terms of global trade. These are very early results, so don't take them, take them too seriously. But what we see is for Australia, it becomes a big trading nation. Obviously from the production, some of it is just used for Australia and New Zealand internally, and then the rest primarily goes to what's called other, other developing Asia and uh, maybe a bit to, and a little bit to China uh, in, in the current model. Um, just to say a few words about this logo that you're seeing in this uh, uh, bottom right. So I'm a member of what's called the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Supergen Hub. It's a research hub that brings together uh, a lot of academics, 21 UK universities, a lot of industrial partners, 34 of them. And what we do is we, we try to create a, a community of people that are interested in hydrogen and in fuel cells. The hub doesn't do research in itself. It's, it's more of a networking and communication and sharing and workshopping kind of environment. And so what we help to do is shape the research agenda and advise our, our research funders on what are the priorities and equally to build a, a good relationship between the practitioners in industry and the researchers in academia so academics have a really good understanding of the industrial challenges and the industrial partners have a good understanding of what are the emerging opportunities in academia um, and so some of the things we've done are produce some white papers uh, you can go to our website and download those which talk about how hydrogen might be used for low carbon heat, for energy security, for future energy systems and the environmental uh, and economic impacts. Also, how hydrogen can, can provide negative emissions because that's going to become an important part of the UK. If we think of the UK today, emissions are about 500 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent and the, the estimate is by 2050 we'll need somewhere between 50 and 100 million tonnes of negative emissions. So between 10 and 20% of our current emissions is what our, our, our negative emissions are going to have to be to, to get to net zero. So to summarise, we're beginning, I think, finally in this third wave to get a much more sophisticated understanding of what is the role of hydrogen going to be in low carbon energy systems. However, having said that, Unfortunately, the way government and industry and practitioners work, they still tend to work on this single issue based approach in terms of policy and interventions. And I think this is the challenge with hydrogen is, is deploying hydrogen, it needs you to take a whole system view, but eventually we have a, 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 you know, a ministry that looks after transport, a ministry that looks after energy, another ministry that looks after housing uh, and so on. And so it's difficult to get these integrated policies going. So for example, I've mentioned, you know, we would expect to see these regional hydrogen hubs primarily driving industrial decarbonization, but providing low carbon hydrogen for some local transport fleets. So you would need to find a way to join up 
the transport system, the industrial system and the energy system. You've probably seen there's a lot of debate about low carbon hydrogen. Do you make it from nuclear energy? Do you make it from renewables? Do you make it from uh, hydrocarbons with CCS? In a way, there's no point in debating that because we'll need all forms of low carbon hydrogen um, and different countries will have different balances of these. So in a sense, it just what makes sense from an environmental point of view and a, an economic point of view is, is what will work out in the end. So what we're doing in the UK, we're defining a low carbon hydrogen standard. And it essentially says, as long as your emissions are lower than <coughs> 20 uh, kilograms of CO2 per megajoule, uh, is that right? I think that's, no, that can't be right. 20 grams of CO2 per megajoule, it counts as low carbon and it can be certified. So we don't care how you make it, you have to meet an outcome and that's the best type of regulation. I think one thing that needs to be reiterated and if you ever read the German hydrogen strategy, you, you'll really see it, is you can't think of hydrogen only in terms of energy strategy. You have to think of it in terms of energy and industrial strategy. And then to get hydrogen up and running, you need to support the whole value chain because it's not plug and play. So you need to look at production, storage, transport and end use because this value chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And we think probably there's not enough work on the end use, the incentivizing people to use hydrogen. So we're putting a lot of emphasis on production, but actually the person producing will not have a market if there's not an end use. So it's an excellent opportunity to, to develop blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, large projects, small projects quickly and get these value chains up and running. And then we need more ecosystems thinking because there are other aspects. So there's a very unglamorous things in the hydrogen supply chain and system like metering, valves, materials, safety, compressors, geological storage and so on. And they also need to be developed quickly. And then you have to think about how that fits with, with regional strategy. So that's all I want to say. Uh, look forward to some questions and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Nile. This is uh, quite insightful notes and a lecture that's quite useful for the Australian context as well. Um, I just remind attendees, please, to share their questions. I do apologize. I've uh, been reminded of a couple of things. First, I needed to introduce myself <laughs> uh, at the beginning, which was a bit rude of me. Uh, my name is Ali Abbas. I'm acting head of the School of Chemical Engineering and the chair of the Australian Circular Economy Conference. And the second thing I was reminded of was that the chat function is disabled. And so please type your questions in and they are coming through. We've got a few already in the Q&A part uh, or, or the feature of the Zoom here. So please uh, feel free to dump your question in the q and I might kick off the Q&A session, Nile, please, just to share uh, a question from my side first. Uh, Australia is picking up quite strongly on the hydrogen economy. And uh, it is, as you, you know, identified quite a strong resource, uh, solar resource that's available to us here. Um, and Australia is being seen as an exporter of energy uh, for the future, particularly of hydrogen. But your four, fourth dot point in the summary here, energy and industrial strategy, is also starting to be more and more understood with these kind of industrial ecology parks that are emerging in Australia. And now the government's funding them quite strongly, setting these industries up co-located to optimise the resource uh, the, inside the, the industrial park. Um, I guess from your analysis you showed in the first few slides around using hydrogen as a decarbonisation strategy in those industrial clusters, as you call them, uh, how serious should we in Australia be looking at that, especially now that we are still in the early phases of developing those such parks? I think that's a, a great opportunity, isn't it? Because you see the challenge with the UK clusters is that they already exist. So now decarbonising them requires a lot of retrofit of the individual assets and then the infrastructure joining the assets. So if you're developing these parks in a more greenfield way, you could almost design them to be low carbon from the beginning 
and you could look at what are the integrated opportunities for using hydrogen as a fuel and as a feedstock. And also then, as I say, how do you integrate those parks with the transport hub? Because obviously you'll need logistics associated with those hubs. So why not make those logistics also hydrogen oriented? So I'd certainly look at that at least as a question. Because um, it sounds like, a, a, you know, it's certainly a lot easier to plan those things in from the beginning. Yeah, definitely. And um, certainly look and, and learn from the UK um, context there with those um, clusters that you talked about. We've got mm -hmm. a few questions, Nila, if you don't mind me reading yeah. to you. Well, the first one says, please explain a bit more on what was that last bit about biomass that achieves net, C, uh, net negative in the graph, slide 17. Oh, yes. OK. So essentially... One way to make hydrogen is to, is, to, is to take biomass, especially, let's say, relatively low carbon biomass, so waste biomass or second generation. So these can be things like um, agricultural residues or forestry byproducts, and you gasify it to make syngas. You take that syngas, which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and you put it through a couple of reactions, which makes even more hydrogen and carbon dioxide. You separate those. So now you've got hydrogen and you've got carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide, you have to store it underground uh, and then you use the hydrogen. So when you look on a whole life cycle, that carbon atom that made the carbon dioxide originally came from the atmosphere to make the biomass. And so you've actually drawn carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, put it underground. So when you do a careful life cycle analysis, you'll have a net negative process. So per tonne of hydrogen, you have a negative amount of CO2 uh, emitted. And so you're actually removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Yeah, thank you, Nile. Another question coming from uh, Dr. Dia Milani from CSIRO. Uh, it says, many argue that ammonia has higher energy intensity and more efficient in long-term transport than hydrogen. What is your assessment of hydrogen storage, transport versus ammonia? Yeah, it's a good question. So ammonia is much easier to liquefy. So that's really why people are interested in it. So the energy to liquefy ammonia is um, relatively low compared to the energy required to liquefy hydrogen. So people are interested in ammonia. The two things that are, are still being debated is, number one, when you are receiving that fuel, if you want to convert it back to hydrogen, the technology is still under development. So we know roughly what the reactions look like to crack ammonia back to hydrogen. We know what the process looks like, but it's not being demonstrated at scale. So you, you would actually need to implement either in a centralized way or at every end use location, a new technology to convert the ammonia back to hydrogen, number one. Number two, ammonia is really very toxic. Um, it's toxic in a different way from say carbon monoxide. So let's say you accidentally have a dose of carbon monoxide, but you survive, then the process is entirely reversible because Carbon monoxide, it binds with your red blood cells, uh, with the hemoglobin, and it reduces your oxygen uptake. But once once you've got rid of it, you're back to waiver. If, 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 if you have some ammonia poisoning, ammonia attacks your lungs, but it actually creates a kind of irreversible scarring on your lungs if you survive. Um, and so people are quite concerned because if you think about ammonia in the context of a process plant, we have a lot of safety systems understanding. We have chemical engineers usually in every process plant. If you suddenly take the context of a ship and you start saying, oh, every ship will have ammonia, and you think of the heterogeneity of operating procedures, of skills, uh, expertise, and indeed the components in the ship, you know, the valves, the pumps, the seals, and so on, you would really need to have a lot of confidence that everything is, is set up correctly for ammonia. That's not to say it is impossible, it just means you need to do it with care. So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and I, I suspect we will see ammonia being used as a long-term energy storage and a long distance energy transport, partly because we already move ammonia around the world as fertilizer or as feedstock. But to go from 
a feedstock to a fuel, obviously that's a, a, the volumes are much greater. So we just need to, to have a lot more care on the safety side of things. Mm -hmm. There's also a few other questions related uh, all on transport. One, I'll just jump to it from Graham Madsen. Uh, the low temperatures required for liquid hydrogen transport, how do you see the future for hydrogen export? Again, very good question. I, I have a feeling that um, we will improve our heat exchanger design and we'll sacrifice a bit on the electricity consumption. So I think looking at developments in some companies, they are enthusiastic from the point of view of the cost reductions they've seen in LNG through better and better compressor designs and better and better heat exchanger designs, they will get some cost reductions in hydrogen liquefaction. Of course, ultimately, there's a, an energy consumption you cannot avoid. Uh, and they'll sacrifice that on the basis that if you make liquefied hydrogen in locations where renewable energy is plentiful, then that additional cost is not that high. So from an economic point of view, I would not be surprised to see trade in, in liquefied hydrogen. And similarly, the ship systems, the insulation, the, the bleed and the re-refrigeration, there's a lot of learning from, from LNG that is in principle deployable to, to hydrogen. So yes, it, it does require additional energy, but it doesn't seem that it will be a complete blocker in the sense that uh, with net zero, you always have to look at what would be the alternative. The alternative probably is ammonia. Um, it's the most obvious and each has its advantages and disadvantages. Thanks, Neil. I continue on, on the topic of transport. Uh, and, and similar question, I guess, but in the context of Australia, you, you may, Neil, uh, or may not have detailed uh, view of Australia's hydrogen situation. So the question from Paul Valerian, how do you envision hydrogen will be transported in Australia? That's a really good question because actually um, the geography of Australia means that you might want to, it depends where you make it of course, but you might want to actually ship it, uh, what's called close coastal shipping, maybe more effective than pipelines. Um, and it depends very much whether it's made by, you know, coal gasification plus ECS or natural gas reforming plus ECS, or if it's made from renewables. I think the challenge with renewables is that the, the, the locations that have a lot of wind or, or solar energy are not that near the population centres in Australia from, from the maps that I've seen of the renewable potential. So certainly what we're looking at there is actually making synthetic fuels in those locations and transporting those. So those are actually synthetic hydrocarbons uh, as one example. But otherwise, I, I guess you take a pipeline of hydrogen to, to the coast or um, maybe retrofit to some extent existing natural gas infrastructure. But yeah, the, the Australia has a lot of advantages, but I think the dispersed Mm. nature of the population centers it will make it more difficult. So true, so true. Um, we switch gear a little bit uh, to a question on sequestration. So do we have sufficient geological sites, storage sites to make CCS work at scale? Ah, yes, I've seen that one. So I think uh, the, the, the question is a good one because of course, what some of the most obvious places are depleted oil and gas reservoirs, but actually, um, there's an order of magnitude, or maybe two orders of magnitude, more storage available in, in saline aquifers. So actually where probably a lot of geological storage will eventually take place is, is not in depleted oil and gas fields. Although those, those will probably be the first ones because they're relatively cheap to use. There's some infrastructure and they're well characterized. Eventually CO2 will end up being stored in, in saline aquifers. And then there's, there's a lot of storage associated with those. Thank you very much. There's a couple of other questions, I guess. Uh, one is about water. And yeah. does hydrogen economy create a burden on freshwater resources? Potentially, yes. Um, it is not, you know, it's not 
a huge figure in relation to other users, but in a, in a water stressed location, it may be the case that every additional industrial process or energy process that uses water would require a permit. And so people are already beginning to look at using low quality water sources like brackish water. Uh, and the reason for that is if you're going to have a process like um, steam methane reforming or um, electrolysis, you need to pre do some pre-processing of the water anyway. So you need to demineralize the water anyway. And so um, if you're dealing with, with fresh drinking water or if you're dealing with brackish water, or indeed there are even now projects that are already being developed for seawater hydrogen production, then you have to invest a bit more in demineralization, but actually the additional energy consumption is, is very low compared to the electrolysis, for example. So I think as it scales up, it would it would start to use the, the, the less attractive sources of water. So obviously, you know, as I said, sort of central West Australia from, from, from my memories where there's a lot of solar resource, but it probably is a water stress region. So in fact, one of the things people are looking at there in the context of synthetic fuels is there are um, technologies that capture atmospheric water and atmospheric CO2 simultaneously. And so at least to make synthetic fuels, the water would be taken from the atmosphere, not, not, from, not abstracted from groundwater. Mm. Yes, there are projects of the sort already running here, Neil, in mm. there. See, of course, but they are progressing. Um, there's a question on economics. You mentioned earlier, Nile, that um, hydrogen price is in the range six to ten dollars per gigajoule. Was that correct? So that was uh, uh, in the context of a specific study done in the US. So it, it's very, very sensitive to the cost of natural gas and the cost of electricity, depending on which pathway you make it. So people usually quote dollars per kilogram. So in the US, if you make hydrogen from natural gas, it costs somewhere between $1, $1.50 a kilogram. Mm -hmm. um, electrolysis at the moment is probably about cheapest might be three to four dollars in, in the most advantaged locations. Um, but there's a target of getting that down to about two dollars in many locations. And that's the same in Australia too. That's the Australian target, Nile. Mm -hmm. We press ahead, there's a couple of other questions and um, here we start to talk about safety, question from Ethan Chen and also from Kelly Smith. I guess, Nina, if I may kind of rephrase both Ethan's and Kelly's questions around safety, can you create, you know, make, make some commentary on, you know, because some of the audience, as Ethan mentioned, yeah. may or may not know the safe as safety aspects of hydrogen. So from your perspective, what are the issues? What are the challenges? I would say there's probably two main issues with hydrogen and safety. So I think the first one is that the so-called flammability range is quite high. So whenever you have a flammable gas and air, you have the so-called flammability range. And if you've got too little of the flammable gas, then the mixture is not flammable. And if you have too much of the flammable gas, then the mixture is not flammable. So if you take hydrocarbons, there's a lower flammability limit and an upper flammability limit. Uh, and that's, you know, let's say medium in size, that range. So the first thing about hydrogen, its lower flammability limit is quite low. So quite a low hydrogen and air mixture is already flammable and its upper flammability limit is, is quite high. So the envelope of flammability is high. So if you end up in a confined space where hydrogen is somehow leaked it's more dense you know it's it's to some extent more dangerous than hydrocarbons if the space on the other hand is not confined you have a benefit in the sense hydrogen is very low density so it disperses quickly so if you have a hydrogen leak in a confined space it's slightly more dangerous but if you have a hydrogen leak in an unconfined space it's arguably less potentially less dangerous Again, you have to do the calculations carefully. So that's one thing, the flammability limits. The second one is this issue of leaks. So hydrogen is a very small molecule. 
So when we think about things like joints and seals and even, even thin pipes, um, you, you, it's easier for hydrogen to find a way through any imperfection in, in, in your whole system, especially as it starts to come, you know, if you're, if you're operating under significant pressure, then hydrogen molecules, to some extent, will make their way through the system. So you need better leak detection systems. And of course, you want to avoid leaks as fast as possible. So you engineer your systems you know, really using the right materials, the right jointing mechanism, the right seals, the right types of compressors, bearings, and so on. So you need to understand how does hydrogen interact with different materials under different conditions of temperature and pressure to avoid the leaks. So those are the two big issues, I would say. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, Nilay, for explaining that. And, and one final question, if you don't mind, Nilay, and we'll wrap up your opinion on blue hydrogen from natural gas wells in Australia, uh, considering 10% fugitive methane emissions. This is from Walter James. And yes. Blue hydrogen from natural gas. And if you may comment on any ideas around hydrogen from biogas, this is from me to you, Nile, as well. Sure. So the, for the first one, that system on a life cycle basis, it wouldn't qualify for the UK low carbon hydrogen standard because you would have to address the fugitive methane emissions. Uh, on the plus side, in terms of carbon mitigation costs, one of the cheapest ways to reduce environmental impact is indeed to deal with fugitive methane emissions. Because just as I said, engineering your system carefully in terms of wells, uh, flow lines, valves, seals, compressors, and so on, if you use best practice, you will go below 1% of fugitive methane emissions. So there's no engineering reason to have 10% fugitive emissions. It's just poor, poor engineering practice. And the big challenge is that the atmospheric scientists every year are revising their global warming potential of methane, and it's only going upwards. And that's because they're not using 100-year potentials anymore. They're tending to use 10 to 30-year potentials so methane is being seen more and more as, a, as an aggressive greenhouse gas, as coming under more scrutiny. So I think it's, it's a good way to get, um, it's a good way to get hydrogen value chains up and running because you produce hydrogen that encourages transport, storage and end use, but then you really need to go back and look at how can I reduce those emissions. One really good thing, is there some very good remote sensing technologies which you can use with, with towers or with drones. So you can actually see using infrared spectroscopy, where are those emissions coming from? And then you can go and fix them. You can find out where the leaks are, for example, or which valves or seals need work. So it's quite cost-effective and quite straightforward to deal with these. And so it's, it's a good idea to, to address them quickly. And the last two COPs have both um, targeted methane emissions as, as quick wins. Yeah. Oh, biogas. Yeah, that's a very interesting one because particularly if you, if you, um, if you even if you vent the CO2, it's a low carbon uh, hydrogen. But if you store the CO2, then that is another example of a, of a negative emissions um, energy vector. So it's a way of sequestering. And the point about the negative emissions is by having a, a valuable product of hydrogen, it can help to pay for the cost of sequestering the CO2. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nile. And with this, with this question, we will call this to an end. Uh, I am sure all the participants uh, have found this extremely insightful, Nile, and uh, very useful for helping us understand also the uh, actions forward for the Australian uh, hydrogen economy context too. I wish to thank you, Nile, thank everyone who has participated uh, this evening in this uh, um, lecture. And I also wish to thank the Faculty of Engineering for its support towards the distinguished lecture series here. Uh, with this, we call the uh, lecture to an end and we hope to see you in person in Australia, Nile, in the future. And uh, on this note, uh, goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much.